Amen. All right. I hope you guys can see if I'm blocking you. Like, we could always just... Can we try something new, actually? Why don't everybody just, like, sit over here since the screen is right here? Make us all feel, like, cozy. I know Sean wanted the whole row to himself, but there's no reason for that. And, and so on. I hope everybody here is also, you know, joining in the community as, as we pray about this. But, like, when this opportunity kind of begin to just kind of think to yourself or envision a church, right? You start to, like, dream about it. Okay, and so, oops, sorry, one second. This is just kind of fun. We'll make today interesting. Okay, here we go. I was looking at the outside architecture of the church we're looking at. Okay, so we're thinking about a church. Okay, if you're to envision the church. How would you want to describe the church? What do you want the church to embody? What do you want the church to feel like when you walk in? What do you want church to do? So you tell me. And I'm going to give you a caution. The reason why I'm doing this is to show you how bad my handwriting is and my spelling. Okay? So if you want to correct my spelling, feel free to. I probably won't listen to you. Okay? So, so how do we envision the church? Huh? Community? Huh? Welcoming? Welcoming. Holy. Holy. Generous. Hmm? Generous. Generous. You say clean? I like a clean church. Okay, peaceful. Loving. Hmm? I mean, I'd like to see it as a church of service. Sorry? (laughs) I won't put you on the spot. (laughs) Huh? (laughs) Sorry. Sean. Raise the door. Any, anything else? It's a place of prayer. Huh? Incense. From where? Because I got incense a couple of weeks ago. We were praying uh, vespers, and we had incense from one of the monasteries in Egypt, and I could not breathe. So, which incense are you talking about? <laughs> Monasteries are no joke with their incense. The sweet swelling. <laughs> sweet incense. Yeah. Anything else? Huh? Okay. No. Sorry? Spiritual. Okay. Anything else? All right. All right. I think that's pretty good. Does this stuff happen organically? Does it happen naturally? Passively? No. None of this stuff happens passively. All this stuff happens intentionally, right? But the thing is, like, this degree of intentionality that we're kind of describing, you know, takes time and energy and resources and commitment and all these different things. But naturally, 
we face challenges, right? We face challenges to being intentional about investing in the church that we're envisioning, right? So what are some of the challenges that we face? Did you say community? Communication. Okay. And what else? Is that resources? I will say family and relationships too. Like their, you know, their commitment. You know, people got jobs. We got jobs. Huh? School. Can I tell you my favorite one every time I talk to somebody? I'm so tired, right? That's a good one that everybody uses, fatigue. I slept for 18 hours on spring break a day. What? Spiritual fatigue? Good. All right. Kind of take that one. Now, even though we, yeah. Uh, sure, I'll take one more. Okay. Okay. Now, even though like we just kind of talked about all our like commitments and the challenges that we have and you know uh, I forgot one like kind of finances we'll say all right but yet we all are generally like a pretty tired society because we're working so hard and putting forth so much energy and so many different things but yet frequently when when you talk to somebody there's and and you know you really talk about like what's missing in life, everybody's able to share things that they're missing in life. Okay, so there's things that we lack in life. Okay? What are the things that, that we tend to lack in life? That when you talk to somebody, even though they have a job and they're so successful and stuff like that, they might say, I lack satisfaction. What else do we lack? Motivation. Huh? Motivation? Community. Sorry? We lack community. Good. Community and I'll kind of tag on to that friendships. Okay. Can you guys like see that or no? Not really? Here. Okay. Good. I was trying to hide my spelling. <laughs> okay. We feel like we're always lacking time. Okay. Energy. I heard commitment. Um, I think. Frequently, you'll find that people feel like they lack a purpose in life, going through motions. What about this one? I feel like we're lacking love and the experience of love. up there. <laughs> but that is a good one. Yeah, purpose. 
Okay. And then, I mean, I hear frequently like, I lack patience. Okay. Forgiveness. Huh? Okay, we lack mentorship. Self-control. Okay. Discernment. Okay. Peace. Very good one. We lack peace about all that we do. Good. Let's move on. Though we lack all these different things, okay, things that we really want, my question now is what are the things that we do have, okay? What, are, what, what possessions do we have? That's not how you spell possessions. <laughs> I caught it before you. That's still not how you spell it. It's all right. <laughs> Things. <laughs> Things that we have. Well, I mean, but, but the thing is like, the thi so the things that we have, like we, like here, uh, let's, start, let's start off easy. So like we have our cars, okay? We have our homes. Homes, we have our families. Communities. We live in the richest country in the world. We have plenty of things. We do have churches, okay? We have church buildings. We have our jobs, our bank accounts. We have our vacation homes. <laughs> Some people have them. I don't <laughs> I'm still working on the board here. <laughs> Okay, we have electronics. Right. We have we got Amazon. <laughs> okay. I think to kind of put it is like we have luxuries. Luxuries. We have health. We have plenty of food. Okay. Good. So, I know you can't read all that, but you kind of get the gist. So we have a church that we envision. We have legitimate challenges that we're all facing. But despite our challenges that we face in investing in the church that we want, you know, we have the church, we have our challenges, but we're still lacking uh, in certain things in life. But yet while we still lack, we still have, okay? We still have. We have different things, all right? And so we kind of look at this picture. There's a picture that very much so is similar to the picture that um, Israel was facing as they were coming back from the exile. Because after the exile, after 70 years of an exile, the condition of Jerusalem was bad, right? You know, like, so in the ways of the exile, they took kind of the, the smartest of the smart and the best, you know, most educated people off into exile. So you had seven years of kind of, you know, people who really didn't know how to run a country, trying to run a country that was in ruins, and then you have them coming back, you know, to back to Jerusalem after the exile is done, and they had real challenges. They had legitimate challenges in life. They had economic challenges. They had challenges with time and challenges with family, um, and, and frequently, 
you know, we look and say, like, oh, it's the Old Testament. Like, how, how much is it like today? But the truth is, like, it's, it's actually very much so like today. You know, that they had real challenges. Um, and they struggled to build the temple. And they actually, they started the temple, and they laid the foundation of the temple, but then they stopped. And they stopped pursuing the building of the temple, and, it, and the foundation just kind of sat there for about 20 years. And in the 20-year period, like, it was just accumulating dust and junk and garbage and everything that you could think of, right? And, and after, you know, this period of time, like, went on for, for about 20 years, the Lord calls on the prophet Haggai to kind of step into the situation. And we're going to pick it up, and we're going to look at the, the book of Haggai. You can... Um, Look it up on your phones. I'll have it here on the screen. Font is big enough for everybody in the back. Okay, great. So when we look at the, the prophet Haggai. He kind of steps onto the scene after the Lord kind of pulls him to the side. And the Lord, like, has a very small exchange, at least what we have recorded here, between him and Haggai. And it's in verse 2 um, that we see this exchange between Haggai and the Lord. And thus speaks the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, he says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 2. This people says. What is God saying? When he says, this people says. Lord's looking down, talks to Haggai, and he says, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Mm -hmm. How does he know that? I agree. You're saying that, he's saying like their agenda is different, right? Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's saying the people are saying, but th like we don't really have a conversation between God and the masses of people. We have the conversation between God and his prophet and then the prophet and the people. But God is coming to the prophet and saying, this people are saying that it's not time, right? So we get the sense that the Lord has been watching. The Lord has been watching for quite some time. And finally coming and, and breaking the silence, he's saying to Haggai, he's like, look, these people are saying it. They may not be verbally saying it, but they're saying it. They're saying that it's not time to build the temple. Right? So God is always watching and observing. And it's interesting because if you can put yourself in, in the place of the people who are probably like coming back from exile, facing all the economic hardships, and looking at how difficult life is, what, are, like, what do we tend to do when life is difficult on our end, in our response to God. God is silent. Where is God in the midst of my troubles? And interesting, God's looking down and saying, well, this people are saying. <laughs> so there's what's happening, but like people are kind of coming in at two different, like, two different directions and to the same problem. So he says, this, this people says that the time has not come that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord, going on to verse 3, then the Lord of the word came by Haggai the prophet saying, and now Haggai's speaking to the people. He says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? All right, so he poses a question just in verse 3. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? And in verse 4, he says, sorry, uh, lie in ruins, verse 5, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
Right? So we have this exchange going on between ha you know, Haggai, who's delivering the message of the Lord, and his people. And he's saying, like, your actions have been saying that the temple, Lord, it's not time for it to be built, like we're trying to recover. All right? But then Haggai's kind of catching them. He's saying, like, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses and lie in the temple, and the as the temple lies in the ruins? What's key in, in verse 4? Right? What's unique about what Haggai says in verse 4? Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses? What do you think that means? He's asking where are your priorities, right? But what's significant about paneled houses, right? Back in those days, when you're in economic strife, like what sort of house did you have? You had four walls that like you're lucky if they connected and if you had a roof, that was a bonus. And all of a sudden, like these people have paneled houses, right? So he's looking... And he's pointing out the different luxuries that they have. All right? Saying you got these paneled houses, but the temple lies in ruin. So he says, consider your ways. Consider, like, your priorities. Consider what's going on inside of you. And verse 6 is probably one of the most famous verses in the book of Haggai, where he says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat and you do not have. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earn wages earn wages to put it in a bag with holes. Man, doesn't this just sound like the rat race of life? You work so hard. We're so fatigued. We expect much, but we look so frequently and we say we have little. You know, and, and with what we have, we're always saying it's not enough. There's, there's some clear dissatisfaction in the people. He's noticing dissatisfaction in the people, right? So when we look at here, like, what do we lack in life? We feel like we lack love, patience, forgiveness, you know, where's purpose? Purpose, satisfaction, all these different things that, like, we're saying that we lack in life, that we're really struggling for. But yet, when we go up, like, what are our challenges? We're so tired, right? I have all these time commitments. There's, you know, my job is really demanding. School is really demanding. All these different things. Finances are limited. Like, we can come up with, with all these different things that, like, are challenges to our life that we're spending all our energy on, but at the same time, we're looking at our lives and we're honest with ourselves that we're really lacking in some key things in life. And so when we go back and look in Haggai, he says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have much. You drink and you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself and no one is warm. And he who earned wages earned wages to put it in a bag with holes. That's code for Uncle Sam, all right, during tax season. All right. So make sure you fly about tomorrow, okay? So we have this situation going on. But yet, he points on one thing. You still have all these possessions. You have your paneled houses. Starting to put together an equation for the people. And so, he says, consider your ways in verse 7. Look at the equation of life. What's it adding up to for you? And then the Lord presents the solution, right? Verse 8, he goes to the solution. He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple that you may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. All right? What's significant about this? Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple. What's it going to take to do that? Right? 
Are they going to contract somebody? Let's contract the Philistines. Maybe they'll do the work for us. <laughs> no. It's going to take time. It's going to take their resources. It's going to take their finances. It's going to take them, you know, to take time away from their jobs. In the midst of a time where, like, you know, they're rebuilding. The economy's not booming. It's a difficult period of time. But he says, like, go up to the mountain. Chop the wood, bring it down, and build the temple. All right? Build the temple that I might take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. All right? But then they go and say, but look at all the challenges we have. Look at all the challenges we're facing. How are we going to do this? How are we going to take time to do this? Verse 9, the Lord says, You looked for much, because this is the point of deliberation in the minds of his people. So he's trying to help them along. He says, You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own houses. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold dew, and the earth withhold its fruits. For I have called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grains and the new wine and the oil, on whatever ground brings forth on man and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Kind of like rough verse. But the Lord is saying all the energy that you have put forward for work, for homes, for possessions, for comfort, it came to little. And I blew it away and I meant it. It almost seems like mean. He's like, why, Lord? Like, we're working hard. Like, we're already just coming back from exile. Like, why are you going to blow away? Why are you going to withhold the blessing from heaven? Like, when we're working so hard. Because the priorities are wrong. The priorities are wrong. Why does God do this to us? Because he, he did it at this time, but he, he does it to us too. Where, like, he will withhold the return that sometimes we expect from certain activities that we partake in in life. He may withhold a return. But why would he do this? To show us that we're not God. Okay, show us that we're not God. In what way? I agree with you, but... In the way that we think that we're going to make everything right by working hard every day and we're going to do it. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. He, he wants us to see things correctly. To see that like we can't be the sole provider of all our needs. That we never can be. And when we make the effort to do that, He will blow it away. He will withhold the dew from heaven. And the dew from heaven, especially for them, like it didn't rain much in the Middle East. It was desert land. So, like, withholding the dew from heaven is something really significant because they're trying to grow crops and they need all the water they can get. So if God's going to withdraw, with, withhold the dew from heaven, like, he's saying your crops aren't going to grow. But he does this, too, because he's a father. He was, first and foremost, he's a father. And what we kind of had, had studied is that he continually is there to, to bring us into him, to reconcile us with him, into a relationship, a personal relationship. And when he sees his children veering off over and over and over again, a father's going to correct, a father's going to bring back because he knows that they can't do it by themselves. And so he looks at us, he's, he's like, if I don't step in and bring my children back, we're going to have exile part two right? I don't want my kids to keep on going off in the wrong direction. I want them to come back, so I'm going to make it hard for them. I'm going to make it difficult for them, right? That's a job of a parent. I know as like kids growing up, like we look at our parents like, why do you make things so difficult, right? It drives us nuts. 
And if you're a parent here, I'm not giving you an excuse to go make things difficult for your kids today, but like we look at their, like it's so hard. But as a parent, you're looking down and like, okay, but if I don't do this, like you're going to end up in trouble, right? He's a father. So he has to with, withhold at times. Withhold blessing, not withhold love. This is not the same as withholding love. This is actually an act of love. But sometimes the act of love is to withhold the blessing in order for there to be a course correction. And so the people consider their ways and they begin to obey. And read that in verse 12. Okay? They, they veer towards obedience. But any time you begin to course correct in life and realign your priorities into the, what is appropriate, right? is it easy? No, it's not easy. You're always going to have discouragement. You're always going to have like, new challenges that come up that want to reshuffle your priorities back to what they were because it's how you kind of created life to be. Right? And so the people start building, but very soon into their building, I'm going to kind of skip ahead to chapter 2. Okay. But very soon into their building, there's a little issue that arises. And we see this in verse 3 of chapter 2. Where Haggai, the Lord tells Haggai, because Haggai wasn't present uh, during Solomon's temple, tells Haggai, go to the people and ask this question in verse 3. He said, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? So what's he pointing out? What do we know about Solomon's temple? What kind of temple was it? Huh? It, it, it was huge. It was massive. It had all the bells and whistles, like golden doorknobs and who knows what, and like it, it was enormous, right? Because it came at the peak of Israel's like kingdom. Right? Back when it was a unified kingdom. David, who like the, the kingdom grew, and then Solomon, who also grew the kingdom. The temple was huge. Right? And it was in 922 when they built the temple. And in 586 it was destroyed. And now we're about 70 years later. And so there's very few people who were still around back when Solomon's temple was still standing before it was demolished. And now they're seeing this new temple, which is like a third of the size. It's like a peanut compared to Solomon's temple. And so they're, they're looking around and they'll be like, this is not like the temple that we know, right? They're, di they're distracted. What are they getting, what are they fixing on? They're, they're fixing on the outside. They're worried about what the outside of the temple looks like. They're looking about the luxuries in the temple. Say, how are we going to do this? Well, truth is like the country, the state of Israel is, is a disaster. Economic strife. They don't have the ability to build like they did in Solomon's day. This is the best that they can do. But the Lord is trying to correct them and give them the right mind to think of it. And so in verse 4, he says, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all of you people, the land of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. This, this word of like, I am with you, this goes all the way back to when they're coming out of Egypt. When Moses was leading them out of Egypt, he says, I'm going to be with you. Okay, we're going to the wilderness. What are we going to do? Don't worry. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to show you how to worship me. I'm going to give you the, the tabernacle. Okay, I'm going to take care of you with judges. I'm going to take care of you with kings. I'm going to take care of you. I will be with you. Stop focusing on the outside. Focus on the inside. Focus on the relationship with me. And so these words of I will be with you, he's bringing it again because he's trying to say, look, think. Have I ever not been with you? Sure, I've corrected you, I've reprimanded you, but I've always been with you, all right? Stop looking at just the temple and the outside, focus on the inside. It says, I will be with you, the Lord of hosts. I'm kind of down here uh, in verse 5. It says, according to the word that I have covenanted, covenanted with you, 
When you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. And we look at verse 6. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and they will come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. All right? Now what I want to focus on is this. The desire of all nations. All right? Because he's saying that this later temple is going to have more glory than the former temple. And the desire of all nations is a way of saying, like, I'm going to bring everybody to me. All right? Was this the role of the temple to bring the entire world and the human race? Was it the job of the temple to do that? Whose job was it? Who's the only person who did that? Christ. Christ was the only one to bring everybody to him. He became the desire of all nations. The glory of the latter temple will be far better than the former temple. And while he is talking about this temple, what this verse is really pointing at is the coming of Christ. Because what did Christ say in the book of John? After he cleaned out the temple and he upset everybody in the temple, what did, how did he leave the temple? Destroy this temple in three days and I'll rebuild it. I'll bring glory to the temple. Right? So Haggai was talking about the coming of Christ, who is the true temple. And so when we really begin to think about this in, the ter in terms of like the New Testament and under the new covenant, under Christ, Right? So we have our temples. We've all been given a temple. But our temple's broken because of sin, because of the fall, because of corruption. Like our temple stinks in the current condition. It's broken. There's envy. There's anger. There's jealousy. There's greed. There's all these different things sitting in our temple. And this temple can't rebuild itself. So who came to rebuild the temple? It was Christ, who came from heaven, incarnate, took on the temple, and made the temple more glorious than before, than in the current state. He rebuilt the temple. He became the fullness of the virtues that we all possess like little bits of. He became the fullness of love. He became the fullness of peace and, and forgiveness and all these different things that we love. All these different things that, if we go back here, and we described our church at the beginning, he was the fullness of it. He was prayer. He was service. He was united with the Father. He was united with the Trinity. He was peaceful. He was loving. He was everything. He was the fullness of the church, right? Right? in one person, in Jesus Christ. And so when we look at that and we look at our temple, it was broken, so he took on our temple to redeem it, to, to give it, like bring it to its original glory. All right, the original glory that was back in the garden when we were created and there was a union with him before sin came into the picture, we were united with him. And, our, and the purpose of the temple <coughs> It was, it was there. It was just to be in, in union with God. And so we have the vision of the church and it embodies everything that we want. 
in Christ because the church is known as the body of Christ. The church is known as the body of Christ. But we struggle. We struggle because we have so many challenges in life to allow this temple to reach its glory. We come up with all these different challenges that take our, our, our mind, our time, our energy away, our finances from investing in this temple to bring it to the glory that it was designed for. But yet we look back at our life and we say, I'm missing all these different things. I'm missing all these different things. I don't have satisfaction. I don't know where my purpose is. I haven't experienced love or forgiveness or anything like that. And we come up with all these excuses. But then if we're honest with ourselves and we look at all the things that we have, we realize that we can reprioritize. We can reprioritize. We can challenge ourselves in the things that we have, in the way that we spend our money, in the, in the possessions that we go after, in the luxuries that we comfort ourselves with. All these different things, they take a part of us, take a part of our mind, our energy, our thoughts, our motivations, our pursuits. And yet we're still left with the desire for a church community that would embody everything that Christ embodied when he walked on this earth. We can pursue a church building. And we can go after. We put an offer on it this week. But the reality of any church building and what it ultimately becomes falls in the hands of every individual. Because in the different choices that we make in our lives, in which we balance kind of the equation of life, that's what we come to church with. We come balancing our challenges and the things that we lack in life and the possessions that we have and the vision for the community that we have. This all comes with us. And if we want the church that we all described here at the beginning, I promise you it's not going to come out of a building. It will come from the individual choices that we all make. It will come in how we spend our time. It will come in the virtues that we pursue as individuals. It will come in capitalizing on the opportunities of forgiveness that we're presented with. All these different things are what really begin to make the church what it is. Because when we do those things as individuals, who do we become like? Christ, who perfected this temple, the temple of our flesh. And that's what we want to see in our church. Is yes, we want a place to worship, but what we want is that the glory of the latter temple would be far greater than the glory of the former temple. And likewise, may the glory of our current temple be far less in glory than that what will come when we all as individual work in our spiritual lives, cultivate that relationship with God, utilize the repentance, the confession, our spiritual rules, all these different things that make us more like the image of God. And then we'll have the church that we all listed, all well, whatever we dreamed up, but it's in the hands of each individual here, not in the hands of the building. It's in the hands of each of us here to make the church what we want. Not what we want, what it was meant to be, which was the image of God. Any questions? Let's pray, clean up, and go see the church. <clears throat>